Welcome to Beyond Her Campus, celebrating 15 years. I'm Julianne Scriven, the Community Director at Her Campus, and we're excited to bring you this inspiring episode of our limited series podcast, celebrating 15 years of Her Campus. In this series, we catch up with some of our most successful alumni, from news anchors and content creators to authors and mental health advocates. These women have incredible stories to share. Get ready for an insightful conversation filled with inspiration and advice. Let's jump in. Hannah, welcome to Beyond Her Campus, celebrating 15 years. I am such a fan of yours. I read Head Over Heels truly in one sitting. I could not get enough. And I think it's especially timely this year with an Olympic year and so much emphasis on women gymnastics. So I have to give a shout out to one of my favorite books right at the beginning. It is so exciting and such an honor to have you on the podcast today to share your journey as an author, as an editor, and how her campus has played a part in that. So thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much for having me. I have such a soft spot for her campus, and we will talk about that, of course. But thank you for reading Head of Our Heels, and thank you for the shout out. Absolutely. You have two very distinct roles in your day to day. You wear two different hats as an author and as an editor. Can you share a little bit about how both roles work and how you balance both of them with your full time with being a writer? Yeah, sure. So I fell into writing fiction by accident. I wanted to be a magazine journalist. That's why I had my internship at her campus in, I think it was 2010. It was a very long time ago. I was still in high school. And I went to school to study journalism and I interned at places like Seventeen and Cosmo and L. And I had this weird sort of like blip in my career where I accidentally got hired as a matchmaker for a luxury dating service. Sort of a long story, but I was 21. I was very much in over my head. I had no idea what I was doing. It was a disaster. It was just at the dawn of apps like Tinder and Bumble. Hinge wasn't around yet. And I was meeting the most fascinating people and having these wild experiences. And so I thought, wait a second, this is a novel. And I didn't think I had the confidence or the talent or the work ethic to actually write a novel, but I wanted to try. And so just as I got my first job, I got my first job at 17. I had like two months in between graduating school and starting my job. And I was like, I'm going to start writing this novel. So the two careers really grew at the same time. And so today I was at 17. I was a dating editor at Elite Daily for five years. And now I'm the deputy editor of Lifestyle and Wellness at Bustle. And I, throughout that, have been publishing books. So my debut, Playing With Matches, inspired by that experience, came out in 2018. And then in May 2025, I have my next novel, Main Characters. And so I really like having an editing job. And that was a very intentional switch to go from writing at 17 to editing at my later jobs, because I can't sit all day writing. I mean, at 17, I was writing from seven in the morning to six or seven o'clock at night. And there's no way to do that when you're writing fiction as well. And so I was curious to edit. I liked the idea of working with writers and being on that side of things. And so it just uses a very different muscle of your brain. And so It's a lot of sort of big picture thinking, it's strategy, it's data analysis, it's creating these relationships with freelance writers and staff writers and a lot of brainstorming and, you know, planning out packages and issues and all of that. And so writing fiction, it can be very, very sort of like very detail oriented and you're working Mm -hmm. on one line and you're working on one sort of tiny thing, um, you know, just a couple pages within this 350 or 400 page book. And so to be able to have both of those is a really nice balance. I couldn't write fiction if I didn't have editing and I think vice versa. I mean, I I couldn't write fiction full time. It's, It's just not something that I would want to do. So I feel grateful to have both. It almost sounds to me like being a writer has helped you become a better editor and being an editor has helped you become a better writer. Yeah, definitely. I think especially in terms of giving feedback to writers or actually I think more it's because I receive feedback from my editor, I could fall apart. I could be like, oh my God, she hates me. She thinks I'm an idiot. She's <laughs> you know, giving me these major <laughs> corrections. And you know, the thing about editing fiction, at least what I find is that she might say something and I might at first be like, oh my God, that's a really big change. Like, I don't like it. And then I'll sit with it for two days and then I'm like, 
oh, that's obviously the right answer. She's completely right. There's no other way to make this book work. And I think that ability to take that feedback and distill it and then run with it and apply it and collaborate with another person to carry out a vision to collaborate and make the product the best that it can be. I think I could only do that because I am an editor. And I know that when I'm editing a writer's work, I'm never sitting there thinking, oh, she sucks. I'm thinking, wow, this is a great story. And here's a little tweak that can make it even better. Because I know what it's like to sit on that side. I think I can digest feedback a lot better. That's so fascinating because I think in any role, not necessarily just something where you are writing, but anything that you're creating, I think can it can be really difficult to initially hear feedback. So I love that advice of give it two days. And then maybe that feedback will a exactly how you mentioned spark that light bulb of of course, this is the right feedback, or Mm -hmm. b show you a different route that maybe is a little bit less exactly what you were envisioning, but gives you the chance to make it better. And at the end of the day, in any sort of creative field, everyone does want to come out with the best and strongest work. And nobody can work in a vacuum. And no matter what you do, truly, in any industry, you're always going to be better if you have somebody to bounce ideas off of and to check your work and to hash out problems. Absolutely. To tie it into writing, I always read the acknowledgement sections. And so many authors mention how writing a book is, at first, it's a very isolated experience, and then it's a team experience. Uh, Does that ring true for you as well? Very much. I mean... My first book, I started totally alone, but I got a lot of encouragement from a creative writing class that I took. So I was really heartened by their encouragement. And they were like, no, like actually you have something here. You should keep working on this. You should expand it into a novel. And so I'm really grateful that I had that encouragement because I don't know if I would have taken the plunge without it. And then later working with my agents and her assistant were really wonderful. They are both really, really, really key to the brainstorming process. And now I'm pulling my editor into brainstorming as well and working on book six, the one that will hopefully come out after main characters. We just sat down and had like an hour long conversation. And it was really, really lovely to get their opinions and ideas because I had, you know, certain ideas and elements that I wanted to include. And I don't know if I would have gotten to this final version of the idea without their input. And just being in that room and hearing, you know, one person would say something. And then if the other two were like, oh my God, that's great. Like we knew that was it. And if somebody tossed out an idea and we're like, eh, And it can be really hard to have that internal sense of feedback because when you're Mm -hmm. just by yourself sort of spitballing ideas, you don't know. Like everything sort of sounds the same. And once you say it out loud in front of another person, you have that instant feedback. And I think that kind of collaboration is invaluable. You did such a wonderful job setting the scene there of the classic NYU student mixed with you in your pink skirt. I think everyone has been in a situation where they have felt like the outsider, like they're not supposed to be there or intimidated. How did you build your confidence enough to say like, I'm supposed to be here. I'm going to move through with this. I think that it is so cool and such an impactful piece to be able to move forward in your sense of self in that way. Well, thank you. I really credit a lot of it to her campus because I was a very shy, awkward kid. I really did not have a lot of confidence. I remember when I was 15, I was sitting in English class and English was my best subject by far, but I was like, I'm not smart. I'm just going to be some kind of receptionist. Not that receptionists aren't smart, but I don't want to have to put myself in a position where I'm leading a room or, you know, I wanted people above me. And then when I started interning at her campus, I saw there are all different kinds of ways to have power. And I remember, you know, just to set the scene, you know, her campus's first office was this little conference room in a Harvard building. And I remember the first time that Stephanie took me up the elevator and walked me down the hall. And it was beautiful because here was this room full of incredibly brilliant women. And they've built such a successful, incredible, amazing company. And so I think number one, that taught me that you can be feminine and have power and be smart and be worthy. And really just the trust that Stephanie put in me from early on was incredibly empowering because here was a person who was saying, Yes, no, I recognize that you have skills and talent and like, let's foster that together. You know, she's, I think, maybe five years older than I am or six years older. And just being able to look up at her and seeing, oh, maybe this is somebody that I could model myself after and grow in that direction. That was really just really inspiring for me. And then I think the more that I worked, you know, she is the one who taught me not sitting down teaching me, but just I learned through osmosis. This is how you write an email. This is how you interact in a professional mm-hmm. setting. This is how you brainstorm this story. And it really sparked this passion and this joy in me. And I thought, wow, like I want this big magazine career. And 
I don't know if I would have gotten there. I, I still have imposter syndrome all the time, but knowing that I have these skills behind me does make me more confident when I walk into a room. You also do hold the distinct honor of being her campus media's first ever intern. And so many of our listeners, so many full-time employees, including myself, kind of followed in that footsteps and were interns ourselves. But I really want to capitalize and hone in on what you mentioned, where by seeing these three women run businesses and, and step it into their dream role or creating a life that they wanted to build for themselves showed you as well how you could do that. And I think it's really a story of mentorship. And I feel very similarly where I was a very shy kid, very quiet, really reserved. And I really did need to see an example of what it could look like for me as somebody who yeah. you know would prefer to stay at home and read a book rather than doing something different. And I think that women in her campus have had such an impact in that way. It's been really, really wonderful. I love going to the her campus conferences because you just see such energy and it's a very specific kind of energy because again, you do see people in pink, in floral, in heels, looking incredible. And you don't get to see that. I would imagine in a lot of industries, I don't know because I've only worked in magazines, media, publishing. I've never worked with a straight man, not once. I'm serious in my entire career. But you know, I hear from friends who do work in business and marketing and other fields that it can be really isolating and lonely to be a woman and to have a lot of pushback and to have a lot of people doubt your skills. And I think it's just really wonderful that her campus has created a space for women to take up space and own who they are. Speaking of another space that I think has been created for women to take up space is your social media accounts. You do such a fun and inclusive and approachable job of sharing everything from gorgeous lake sunset pictures over the summer and your travels to also giving advice to writers in all stages of the authorship process from trying to brainstorm through how to get an agent to like, okay, I wrote this book. What do I do? now, all of the stages of the process. What advice do you have for people who do want to share their genuine selves on social media while keeping their accounts professional as well? Because you really have done such a great job of striking that balance. Well, thank you. I think, first of all, consider the industry that you're in. I think a big part of why I get to be so personal on social media is because I work in an industry where that's really encouraged. And especially the time that I came up, I graduated in 2015, and that was when Instagram was really taking off. And the magazine editors who were getting the big opportunities, the big stories, promotions, working in really cool places were on the rise, I think, in part because people could see, oh, look, they had this whole life on Instagram. They look successful. I think that people want to get to know you. People want to see a face, a personality. If social media isn't your thing, fine, great. But like, if it is, I think don't be afraid to put yourself out there. There was a switch where I realized, oh, wait a second, like I have sometimes like a silly sense of humor and I can be sort of like tongue in cheek. And like I, you know, I send summers on a lake and I sort of play up this like silly nautical whatever vibe that's sort of like a little bit exaggerated, but that's how I am with my friends. And I would so much rather be like that than trying to put on this like very like sturdy, like professional friends all the time. Yeah. So one day I was like, no, 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 like I'm not going to delete this little joke that I wrote. I'm just going to post it. And I think that's relatable. That's how you connect with people. And you can even see this just in the way that social media has shifted from Instagram to TikTok. There was this very, very like perfect polished vibe on Instagram that used to, you know, dominate social media. And I mean, I can't tell you how many brunches I meticulously organized in like 2015, where it was like, oh, the latte is at like a 45 degree angle to the breakfast sandwich. And, you know, and like that you take the the picture directly overhead with, you know what I mean? Whereas on TikTok, like people roll out of bed in their pajamas and they're messy and they're crying and you're like, wait, that's what I want to watch. And so I think that there is value in sort of being authentic, being a little bit messy. And that's, that's how people want to engage with you. There has been such a shift. You're right with that TikTok component where now people can be a little bit more themselves and are showing pieces of themselves that they never would have a few years ago. And I think that's going to be continued, especially with such an emphasis on posting authentic content, with posting content that makes sense for you, with being able to follow people. And I also think it feels a little bit more like you get to know everybody. And especially as a writer, I'm curious how your social media has 
impacted your relationship with your readers? Do you feel like you can connect with them more? Do you feel like you can feedback from them, what they loved, things like that? Completely. I do have readers in my inbox and my DMs saying like, oh my God, I loved your book. Or, I mean, there's nothing better than that to know that you've created something that entertained somebody or meant something to them or moved them emotionally in some way. To, so to get that feedback, it really, really, really is deeply meaningful to me. And yeah, it's just, it makes it more exciting. It makes it more fun. Readers' enthusiasm for my books is quite literally the reason that I can do what I do. I would not get a book deal if readers were not excited about me. And so when I say that I wouldn't have a career without my readers, that's true. I, I just could not have the opportunity to do this in a public setting. And so I'm just truly deeply grateful for every reader and to be able to like click on their handles and just like get a little peek into their life, whether it's sharing books that they love or their friends and family, their dog, their vacation. It's like, oh, this is who I'm writing for. This is cool. And I always just really love getting a peek of readers' lives too. You have been teasing it and you just announced your new book with the most beautiful book cover uh, I've ever seen, Main Characters. It is coming out next spring. We are so excited for all things sunsets, all things loons, all things Maine, I can only imagine. Uh, What can you tell us about it? Yeah. So I grew up spending summers on a lake, a little lake in Southern Maine, and it's my favorite place in the world. And I always really, really wanted to write a book set there. Setting is always really inspiring to me. And so this is a grown-up parent trap. It is about two very different women who meet for the first time in their early 30s after learning that their father has unexpectedly died. They were Half sisters raised separately. The dad kept them apart and they meet for the first time at his lake house. And they spend one very hostile, difficult, transformative summer together. And one one sister is a very chic sommelier living in New York. And she, you know, just is very immersed in this like kind of sexy, fast-paced restaurant world and has an affair with her hot older boss who's married. Not great, but it happens. And the other (laughs) sister, Lucy, is a high school English teacher, born and raised and still living in this small main town with her high school sweetheart, who at the start of the novel has just left her. And I deeply love these women. I have been hanging out with them in my head for about like four years now. And that's like a weird thing about being an author. Like you create these people and you're like, man, like I really wish that I could hang out with them tonight. (laughs) They feel like my friends. And yeah, the book is set at sort of a fictionalized version of uh, the lake that I spend time on. And there's, I just want it to feel like a vacation. So in the book, like you said, the characters are going out on a boat at sunset to watch this like beautiful scenery unfold. And they are just like soaking up the best of summer. And so I really hope that readers enjoy it. You mentioned you grew up going to Maine for summers. How did writing a book based on some place that obviously holds such a meaning for you, how did that inspire your creative process? Uh, Did you find it more emotional to write about the setting for this particular book? Yeah. I've always written books set in places that I've lived, but this one was so, so, so special to me because I do most of my writing there over the summer, most of my first drafts. And I really like to write outside. So I write long hands in a notebook so I don't have to be tethered to my laptop. I can be out on the water. Sometimes that means on a boat, but sometimes that means literally I tether an inner tube to the dock and I sort of sit there and I very carefully, precariously have my notebook there like a foot over the water. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And so, you know, when I was writing, if I was stuck on a detail, literally I would just like lift up my head and look out and I was like, okay, what is the texture of this tree? You know, um, and so I really enjoyed it, and it really made the process so much more personal and meaningful, but also I think fruitful. I think that hopefully that really shines through. And early readers, uh, my agent, editor, beta readers, critique partners, they've said that the setting feels like a character in its own right, and I, I'm really excited about that. And one of my own favorite authors is Ellen Hildebrand, who brings Nantucket to life in such gorgeous, luscious detail. And my hope is to try to follow in her footsteps, but those are very big shoes to fill. You just mentioned you write longhand, sometimes precariously, and I know you have shared quite a bit about that longhand writing process on social. Tell us a little bit about that. Obviously, that takes longer than sitting down and just typing out words. So tell us about that and how it has shifted your writing process, what it's like to write longhand, and how it's impacted you. Yeah, I think I wrote three or I think it was maybe my first three books just on a computer. And I mentioned I love Ellen Hildebrand. I think she's a genius. And I was following her on Instagram and I noticed she writes in notebooks. 
she lives part of the year in Nantucket, part of the year in St. John on the beach. And so I see that she gets to just, you know, write in this really relaxed way. And I was like, oh, that's that's incredible. And what I found is that it makes me so much less self-conscious about what I'm writing because on a computer, I could type a sentence and delete it and be like, oh, that's bad. Like, try it again. But when I'm writing longhand, that takes longer, like you said. So I just don't bother. I, I might, you know, cross out a word and try again. Or if I get a different idea, like 30 seconds later, I'll put a little asterisk above and, you know, go back and just like scribble it out. But my rule is you just have to keep going. And that really gets you into such a flow. I wish I knew more about the science behind it. But when your brain is in that kind of flow, not only does it make you smarter and more creative, but I think it, it's really good for your mental health as well. And so it's just made the process so much more enjoyable, especially because, you know, it's does let me get outside. Or last night I was writing at an airport bar. You know, I'm writing in all these places where I wouldn't necessarily want to lug around my laptop. And so that's just, I mean, even if it might take longer to write one specific word, I'm writing all the time. So it's been really helpful. And yeah, I'm, I'm never going back to a computer. I think the other big piece I can only imagine with writing longhand is whenever I get stuck on a creative project, my initial instinct, unfortunately, is to just like check Twitter, check Instagram, yes. and it almost makes it so you can't do that because you mm-hmm. don't have your computer to just open a new tab. You don't have your phone right there. And I can only imagine that that is so helpful, as you said, to just like, I'm stuck. I can like look up and actually think and process versus going and seeing like what is trending. Absolutely. It is game changing. That is a huge piece of it. You don't get distracted. And yeah, I mean, I think you just, I will say this out loud. I want everybody to hear this who is writing a book. My first drafts are really bad. If you talk to any author out there, they will pretty much all tell you the same thing. Typically, I will write a very messy first draft and then I'll go back and polish it. And that's not even editing. That's just like making it something workable. Yeah. So don't worry if it's messy. Just You just need to finish it. I think the number one tip that I tell aspiring writers or first-time novelists is finish it because you cannot edit something that isn't there. And so when I was writing my first novel on a computer, but still, I gave myself a six-month deadline for the first draft. And I don't know if I would have ever had the motivation to finish it if I didn't have that deadline ticking in the background. Absolutely. With that advice, with jumping from a first draft that feels messy, but finishing it, What advice do you have? I've heard so many different pieces of this and and every author is kind of different. So I'm curious your take. You've written that first draft. It is messy. It is something that is there, but it's not polished. What is your advice for diving back in with that second draft? Do you wait a little bit and go back to it? Do you immediately start tearing apart what you've just done? Tell us about that process. So, well, when I'm writing long hands, I, I type up all of my pages. And I've had a lot of people say like, oh, do you edit as you go? And the answer is absolutely not. Because number one, if your brain is bouncing back and forth between writing mode and editing mode, like, you just feel really scattered multitasking in that way is really, really hard. So I just type, barely even look at the words, just type them up. And then you know, by the time that I've finished writing the whole novel, you know, the beginning is now fresh to me. Or you might put it in a drawer for a few months, which I've done for previous books. Because yeah, going back to it with with fresh eyes is really key. And you just can't be self-critical. You just have to say, I'm really proud that I wrote all these words and have faith in yourself that you're going to be able to put them into something that eventually makes a little bit more sense. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, with writing, you kind of have to balance two sides of yourself. You have to balance the side that's like, this isn't perfect. I trust it will get there with like, oh, this isn't good. This needs work. And you sort of need to have both mentalities. But I think it's just a matter of knowing yourself and being protective of your mental health and understanding when you have to switch between the two. You brought up mental health. This is a topic that comes up for our Her Campus readers, for Her Campus followers very frequently, especially because it can be so difficult to be in college balancing school and mental health. It can be so difficult to be post-grad balancing potentially your first job, maybe your biggest promotion that you've ever had with your identity, with your own personal goals, as well as maintaining a mental state that feels good for you. Can you share a little bit about how you prioritize your mental health? Yeah. I mean, there have definitely been periods that have been hard. I remember 
so distinctly, maybe it was like my first week of college and I was riding the elevator up to my dorm room and I was like, oh my God, I have this to do. I have this, I have this, I have this. And I was like hyperventilating in the elevator and everything got done eventually. Like you will always get everything done. But yeah, I mean, now to be honest, like I talk to my therapist every week. I love her. I take medication. You know, I try to get outside. I talk to my friends and family. You know, you have to learn routines and tricks that make yourself feel good. So I know that if I'm just feeling like really sort of like overwhelmed, I'm going to get up and go outside and take a walk in the park. And I know that when I have my phone in sight, like literally it's right here right now, I like want to push it into an ocean. (laughs) You know, it's like the more you can step (laughs) away from your phone, the better I think you feel, at least for me. And so I think it's really about, you know, getting to know yourself and discovering what makes you feel really good. And that could look different for everybody. I think it does look different for everybody too, especially with so many careers and so many jobs that are forcing is a little bit strong, but do kind of force you to be glued to your phone for a majority of the day. I think figuring out that boundary of setting it down, walking away, writing longhand and finding that peace is so important. It is. Yeah. And it gets easier. And yes, I mean, somebody once told me there is not a single day that you have not gotten through so far. I love that. I think about that all Mm -hmm. the time. And I think college in particular can be just really overwhelming because, you know, you're probably living in a new place with people that you are either just meeting for the first time or maybe they've been a friend for a year or two, but, you know, you're still getting to know each other and you have the pressure of school and all of your other responsibilities, whether that's work study or a job or an internship or extracurriculars and, you know, this looming idea of, oh no, like soon I have to be in the real world. But just, I think even in the the hectic world of it, just like try to carve out a few minutes of peace, even if you're just walking to class, like put in your headphones, play music that you like and know that one day you will get through it. And sitting here right now, I can remember a couple really horrifying college days, but it's, they're gone. I don't remember them. <laughs> the vast majority of it, I know it was a blur, but like I'm sitting here now knowing that I do a better job at work. I'm better at multitasking. I'm better at juggling all the different responsibilities that I have because I got through those days. You have perfectly teed up our first rapid fire question, which is what would you tell your 21 year old self? Oh, take the pressure off. I once cried because I didn't get an internship that I really wanted. And what I did instead was this matchmaking job that changed my life for the better forever. And I wouldn't have gotten that otherwise. So yeah, take the pressure off. Don't be too hard on yourself and be open and flexible to what the universe brings you. That is so wild to think about, though, the idea of if you had received the internship that obviously you wanted, like that everything would have shifted for you. So I think that is such important advice. Our second rapid fire question here is, what is something you're looking forward to? Ooh, I have a bunch of travel coming up. I'm going to South Africa next week to see a safari and wine tasting. And I'm just excited to see cute baby animals. That is definitely something to look forward to. My sister went to South Africa and in one day, in one uh, 12-hour period, she went skydiving and swam with sharks. So I think that is a very magical place and I think you're going to have the best time. (laughs) I'm not that brave. (laughs) I can't imagine the adrenaline rush of like when she went to bed, how she was feeling. Our last rapid fire question here for listeners who want to stay updated on your new book and more, where can they follow you and how can they stay in touch with you? Yeah. So I'm most active on Instagram. It's Hannah Orens, H-A-N-N-A-H-O-R-E-N-S. And I post a ton about my life and also writing tips and what I'm reading on my Instagram stories. And then also I just launched a new Substack. It's my newsletter about author life and it's just, you know, fun shopping picks. And uh, that's hannahorenstein.substack.com. That did make me have one more rapid fire question. I love to hear this from authors. Uh, Tell us what you're reading right now. Oh gosh, I'm in the middle of Men Have Called, I think it's Men Have Called Me Crazy or Men Have Called Her Crazy by Anna Marie Tendler. Really dark memoir about mental health, but also about being an artist and just like getting through hard times. And I really recommend it. I also recommend it. I finished it last week. I did the audio version and hearing her tell her story is just one, it was so long lasting and so impactful. Yeah, she's a really talented writer. She is. Hannah, thank you so much for being on Beyond Her Campus, celebrating 15 years. It was so fun to talk to you and get to know you a little bit more. We cannot wait for main characters out next spring. Thank you so much. And congratulations on 15 years. That wraps up another episode of Beyond Her Campus. 
celebrating 15 years. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you loved this episode, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to leave a review. We'll be back in two weeks with more incredible stories from our amazing alums. Until then, HCXO.